Moving on from plant assets, we will focus next on intangible assets and natural resources. Um, intangibles and natural resources have the same sort of life cycle issues that plant assets do, but some differences do exist that we will discuss here. First, some issues we face when accounting for intangible assets. Intangible assets lack physical substance, which makes it difficult to determine the asset's useful life or any residual value. Many intangible assets involve exclusive rights or privileges or competitive advantages. Examples include patents, copyrights, licenses, leaseholds, franchises, goodwill, and trademarks. Now, lack of physical substance doesn't necessarily imply an intangible asset. Notes and accounts receivable, for instance, lack physical substance, but they are not intangibles. We will review the major type of intangible assets and, and related accounting on the next few slides. An intangible asset is recorded at cost when it is purchased. They are not recorded as an asset unless they are purchased, in fact. The cost of developing an intangible asset uh, is generally recorded as an expense because it is too difficult to determine how much the intangible is really worth unless it is purchased in an arm's length transaction from a third party. Once purchased, intangibles are then separated into those with limited lives or those with indefinite lives. If an intangible asset has a limited life, its cost is systematically allocated to expense over its useful estimated life through the process of amortization. Amortization is similar to depreciation, but we only use the straight line method for intangibles. If an intangible asset has an indefinite life, meaning that no legal, competitive, economic, or other factors limit its useful life, it should not be amortized. Intangibles with limited lives are amortized over the shorter of the legal or estimated useful life using the straight line method. Two of the most common types of intangible assets that are purchased are patents and copyrights. A patent gives the holder the exclusive right to manufacture and sell an item or process for 20 years. A patent is amortized using the straight line method over its useful life, but never more than 20 years. Now, many companies amortize patents over a very short period of time. Patents could be held on new inventions, products or processes such as cell phones and computer technology, drugs, and manufacturing equipment. Right now, you are working on a computer and likely have a cell phone nearby. Many patents have been filed on the technology you are using in those electronics. Some companies have been formed to actively purchase and sell patents in the hope of finding the next hot new technology and earning a fortune from doing it. These companies are sometimes not very nicely referred to as patent trolls. A patent troll uses patents as legal weapons instead of actually creating any new products or coming up with new ideas. Instead, patent trolls are in the business of threatening lawsuits. They often buy patents cheaply from companies who are down on their luck and selling the resources they have left, such as patents. Now, a copyright, on the other hand, is an exclusive right granted by the federal government to the holder to publish and sell a musical, literary, or artistic work for the life of the creator, plus 70 years. Most copyrights are amortized over a short period of time using the straight line method. Copies of it, copyrighted examples of copyrighted items, pardon me, include songs, software, books, movies, photos, and written music. You may be familiar with lawsuits filed by the Justice Department uh, against individuals who downloaded pirated music without paying for it. <clears throat> Those people were violating copyright laws. This video and slide deck are protected by copyright because copyright is implied when someone creates a work. A trademark or trade name is any symbol, name, phrase, or jingle that is identified with a company, product, or service. 
No other party may use the trademark or trade name without the permission of the holder. Many trademarks are extremely valuable. Think about some trade names and symbols you know. The McDonald's Golden Arches, the Chevrolet bow tie emblem, the Apple log, uh, logo on the iPhone. They're all familiar examples of symbols that have been trademarked. Note that if the company owns the trademark uh, and plans to renew it indefinitely, um, then that company will not amortize the cost associated with the trademark or trade name. Other intangibles include such items as software, non-compete covenants, customer lists, and so forth. The accounting for them is much the same as described above. An intangible asset called goodwill can be created when one company buys another company. Goodwill is the most frequently reported intangible asset and is a premium paid for such things as a prime location, a customer base, or a reputation. If the purchase price of the company is greater than the fair value of its net assets and liabilities acquired, goodwill is associated with the transaction. Goodwill is not amortized. Each year we must test to see if there has been any impairment in the carrying value of the goodwill and if impairment exists, we will reduce the goodwill account and recognize a loss in value. Natural resources are another type of long-lived asset that companies must account for throughout their life cycles. Let's define what they are and take a brief look at how their cost is allocated to expense over time. Natural resources are assets that are extracted from the natural environment and include standing timber, mineral deposits, coal, oil, and gas fields. The total cost of a natural resource includes exploration and development costs. Natural resources are reported on the balance sheet at costless accumulated depletion. Now, depletion is similar in concept to depreciation. It is the process of allocating a natural resources cost to the period of its extraction. The depletion expense per period is usually based on units extracted from cutting, mining, or pumping. Accordingly, the units of production method is the most common form of computing depletion. Let's consider a mineral deposit with an estimated 250,000 tons of available ore. It's purchased for 500,000 and we expect zero salvage value. The depletion charge per ton of ore mined is then $2 computed as 500,000 divided by 250,000 tons. If 85,000 tons are mined and sold in the first year, the depletion charge for that year is $170,000. If the company extracts and sells 85,000 tons during the year, depletion expense will be $170,000. 85,000 tons times $2 per ton. The journal entry to record depletion is to debit depletion expense for the mineral deposit for $170,000 and credit accumulated depletion mineral deposit for the same amount. At the end of the period, the balance sheet reports the mineral deposit as shown in this slide. Since all 85,000 tons of mined ore are sold during the year, the entire 170,000 of depletion is reported on the income statement. If some of the ore remains unsold at the end of the year, however, the depletion related to the unsold ore is carried forward on the balance sheet and reported as ore inventory, which is a current asset. That's it for the assets section of the balance sheet. Can you believe it? Next, we will move over to the credit side of the accounting equation and learn about liabilities. See you soon.